welcome friends to the celebration of bandara of great master hazur maharaj baba sawan singh my master the celebration is done on 2nd of april each year because the great master passed away on 2nd of april 1948 people ask me most of us celebrate birthdays of people not the death days of people how come we are giving so much importance to the day when he died there is a special reason for that the reason is that we don't really die our body dies our soul doesn't die soul is immortal there are other bodies within this body which also don't die in fact we are trapped in a physical body and when we think that death has overtaken us actually we have been released from a body and are born again in our true form in the inner form a form in which we have far more mobility and freedom than we ever have in this physical body therefore we do not consider the death is the end of the self it is only the end of one of the costumes we wear during our long sojourney long journey and long stay in this physical universe so that is why we do not consider that the day of death is in any case a day of actually finishing our life a certain higher type of life begins on this day that is one reason why we don't consider this as a day of death the more important reason is that for disciples of such a great master like azur maharaj baba sawan singh who had the privilege to be sitting at his feet which i had the privilege to sit at his feet for us it is a great day of rejoicing because he becomes available to us even more then he was available to us when he was in his physical body it is amazing that when a perfect living master is in his physical body we have hardly any chance to see him especially if there are many of us trying to have a closer relationship with him on the other hand he has told us when he initiated us which means when he accepted us as his permanent friends and permanent court travelers to our true home at that time he told us that he has manifested himself within us we did not get a chance to see how he had manifested himself within us because we could see him outside but when he dies he is manifesting himself within us we see him more clearly than we ever saw him before so for us he did not die in fact he is alive more now than he was on the 2nd of april 1948 and he has been there for his disciples ever since he never died that is the beauty of getting initiated by a perfect living master that he never dies and he also tells you that you never die that our soul is immortal and our relationship with the perfect living master is not a physical relationship it's a relationship of soul to soul these perfect living master do not come into this world to establish anything physical for us they do not come to have a physical relationship for the material world they come only to take our soul back home and since they come in human form in a world with billions of human beings they cannot take all those who have to go back home so therefore they take a select group of people who constitute their destiny as human beings these souls that a perfect living master takes with him back to the true home to such kind are marked souls for that particular master there have been masters all the time to take those who are marked to go back home and who are those who are marked to go back home those who have been seeking to go back home whoever has been seeking will go back home the secret is the seeking of our true home 
if we are happy to stay on longer in this material creation, they don't bother us. They say, go, have a good time. This is your time to keep on enjoying or suffering this physical world, having an experience of duality, experience of positive and negative, experience of ups and downs. Keep on having it. But when you are tired of this, when you feel you have had enough of it, and you feel it is not our place, when you begin to feel that, then you become a seeker. When you seek earnestly in your own heart, within yourself, a perfect living master appears in your life by coincidence and says, yes, I have arrived and we are going to travel together and go back home. Unlike other teachers, unlike other masters, perfect living masters do not come to teach us anything. There are so many others who can teach us. Nor do they come to say to make us better people. Because if we become better people, we get better karma in the next life. Therefore, they come not to make us better people or worse people or improve our lives or, or make society better or to do work for, the, for campaigning for somebody. They don't come for any of these things. There are thousands of others who are doing that. They come with the simple mandate of picking up their marked souls. That's their only purpose. That whoever is ready and is in their list of marked souls at that time, at that place, they pick those souls and take them back home. They do not lay any conditions. They do not say that you have to be wise or you have to be doing so much meditation or you have to be in this kind of person or you have to dress up in a particular way or eat a particular food. Or They do not look at that at all. They just say, this is, a, this is a soul that is ready to go back home and it is now my duty, my mandate to take this soul back home. So they come, enter our life, become our friends and through friendship accept us through the process of initiation. And then they take us back home. They know there are many others who can teach us. So we don't learn, learn anything from them. We just go with them because they take us with the power of their love. They don't take us with the power of their teaching. They are those who can teach even better than them. So therefore, their qualification is that they have unconditional love for us because they have come for us and pull us with their unconditional love. That is why when they come into our life, we have a difficult time finding out who they are because they come like ordinary people. They are sometimes more ordinary than ordinary people because it is an only an ordinary person who can be a friend of ours. An extraordinary person cannot be a friend of ours, can be admired by us, can be entertained by us, can be entertained, entertain us, can even be worshipped by us, but cannot be a friend. Their method of taking us back home is not by showing us extraordinary powers, not by showing extraordinary miracles, but by taking us home with the power of their love. They show a lot of private miracles. Those are so miraculous that you are stunned by those miracles that happen in daily life. And yet, when you tell your friends you had a miracle, they explain it away. That was just a coincidence. That was no miracle. That means they can confine your miracles to yourself. That's a great art to create a miracle for you. And yet nobody believes it's a miracle. That's the power with which they come here. They be, pretend to be teachers. They function like teachers for a while because we love to be taught. They, they know that our mind wants to be taught, our mind wants to learn. So they become teachers and begin to teach us, all the time knowing that this is just a temporary phase. They know we have to struggle to get anything in life. They know our mind is trained to struggle to get anything in life. So they make us struggle, do more meditation, two and a half hours, even more. You want to get something, work hard. 
दे पुट अस टू द सेम ट्रैक्स विच वी नीड बिकॉज ऑफ आवर माइंड्स और माइंड्स हैव बीन ट्रेन वी कैन गेट नथिंग विदाउट आवर एफर्ट सो दे से पुट इन मोर एफर्ट देन वॉट हैपन्स वी पुट इन मोर एफर्ट एंड वी डिस्कवर एफर्ट इज गिविंग अस नथिंग एंड देन वी थ्रो अप आवर हैंड्स एंड से दिस इज नॉट ए पैथ ऑफ एफर्ट इट इज अ पैथ ऑफ effortlessness it is something else and then our mind is such then we try very hard to do meditation do their thing they told us effortlessly a man once wrote to me i have found out the secret the spiritual path is not a path of effort at all the more effort you put in the more ego you are developing the ego grows when you say i have put in so many hours i have done so much effort i have done all this the i becomes very strong therefore that man wrote to me i have discovered that it is not something that you put effort because that only creates the big obstacle of ego further on your path therefore at the end of the letter he wrote i am now going to try very hard for the effortless meditation <laughs> that is our mind that's how the mind works it can't get out of this that is why these perfect living masters come and join us in our effort they say yes go ahead make your effort till you find that the effort doesn't count they make you go through intellectual study they make you study hard they say study books listen to discourses why because we think that is the only way we can get knowledge so they engage us in intellectual discussions they answer our questions they engage in a little bit of debate with us over various issues all the minds questions which come up they want to engage us in that all the time knowing that none of this is going to take them to their true home but when we are tired of this we find the intellect cannot reach the point where we want to go then they come up with the true method by which they take us back home which is the only true spiritual method love and devotion there is no spirituality without love and devotion the rest is all mental games we play mental games they play mental games with us but they know that eventually the only thing that will take us to our true home is love and devotion why do we say love and devotion because devotion is a response to love whenever we feel loved by somebody we automatically get devoted to that person that is why we use this phrase love and devotion all the time and this is so important that very often we forget that the whole path is based upon love and devotion the whole spiritual path is based upon love and devotion people meditate mechanically for years hoping that something will happen nothing happens because it's not a mechanical exercise at all meditation without love and devotion is hollow it does not yield anything but if you have love and devotion when you meditate you get something and what is meditation after all meditation is to meditate upon something we are all meditating all the time but we are meditating on worldly things we are meditating on outside relationships we are meditating upon outside objects we think about them all the time that is meditation here what they say is meditate upon the truth meditate upon the self meditate upon love and devotion for the lord meditate and develop your love and devotion for the master and these things require that we use meditation as a means of keeping quiet making yourself still spending time closing your eyes so that you don't have to look outside and talk to god talk to your master talk to yourself find out who is inside you all religions without exception have said that the truth lies within you not outside they even explain that what is outside is merely a creation it's like a shadow it has been made to look real because we wanted to experience reality that is why the process of illusion has been used not to create illusion but to create reality and therefore we are experiencing reality outside this was just for a very great experience we wanted to have a good experience so we are having it it's designed by us 
we designed when we were all only one, when there was only one creator. And then we spread ourselves into so many and became the many from the one in order to have an experience of created reality. And that's what we're having right now. There are many other levels of consciousness where you can also experience different kinds of realities. We created reality, not illusions. We use the process of illusion to create reality. That is why at any one time, only one kind of experience is real for us. At this time, the physical experience is real for us. And that is why a physical master is real for us. And that is why all physical activity we are doing is real for us. But when we go to a level different from this level of consciousness, whether it is higher or lower, this level of reality disappears. Another level of reality opens up. Let us think of going to a lower level like dreaming. We go to sleep and have a dream. In the dream, we have a different world, a different reality, following different laws of nature, following different laws of time and space. In a dream, you can skip from one place to another in an instant and looks absolutely normal. Nobody questions. In a dream, you can jump 50 years and it looks normal. There are different ways in which we have an experience of time and space in a dream. The very laws of experience change, as yet they look absolutely normal. Normal to who? The same self that went to sleep. When we have a dream, it is not somebody else dreaming. It's the same self that was awake. The same self becomes the dream character and moves around without knowing that the person is sleeping, that he is sleeping outside, somewhere on a bed. When you wake up, we discovered that was just a dream. It was not real. While the dream lasted, it was real. We created a reality by shutting off our experience of wakefulness. If we could also remember what we were like when we were awake and also had a dream, the dream would never become real. So we are so keen to experience reality. All the time we are keen to experience reality and that is why we make the dream a reality. When we wake up, we know that was not real. The experience of waking up is one of the greatest experiences we have ever had in life. Because that is one experience where you never ask anybody, give me proof. But if in the dream you were talking to some people and say, I am going to wake up one day, they say, you are awake. They'll tell you in the dream. And then you say, we are not awake, we have to wake up. They say, give some proof. You can give no proof. When you wake up, actually, even before you have opened your eyes, you are still lying in your bed with your eyes closed. You still know you are awake. You don't move your limbs. You don't pinch yourself. You don't take any proof. Supposing when you wake up in the morning, 10 people come to you and say you are still sleeping, you will not believe them because the evidence of wakefulness lies in itself that you are awake. Nobody can then challenge you are not awake. What is this experience that when you wake up, you don't need any proof? But for all other things, we are constantly asking for proof. The intellect is constantly asking for proof. Where is the proof? People say you can wake up further. Where is the proof? Well, you are in one state of consciousness. You cannot prove anything about the other state of consciousness. But when you wake up, you don't need any more proof. The proof itself is embedded in the waking up process. What is the waking up process that enables you to be absolutely certain you are awake? When you get up in the morning, what makes you absolutely certain? You had a dream, you slept and now you are awake without any asking for any proof, without pinching yourself to see if you are awake. The proof lies in the fact that your consciousness is able to recall the memory that you did go to sleep. You remember you went to sleep in that bed and therefore now you are awake without even opening your eyes, you are in the same bed, the whole field comes back. The memory of your state before you went to dream, before you went to sleep comes back. It's the same awakening when you go to a different higher level of consciousness. When you go to a higher level of consciousness, you remember that you were there before you were even born here. 
you remember that's a much longer life than you have here this was a very short life that's the kind of experience you have it carries its own proof therefore when we say let us go on a spiritual journey to our true home it is not really a journey it's a series of awakenings we awaken ourselves again and again we awaken ourselves to find that there is another self in us which has a much longer life it was there and moved from body to body that there were reincarnations taking place we don't debate these things when we are in a physical body is there life after death or not is there reincarnation or not i believe it i don't believe it that silly argument wake up and see if you were there or not there is no proof of a pudding than eating it that's the best proof there is no proof of what is after death except by dying and seeing if it is there or not therefore if somebody says i don't believe there is any life after death okay die and tell us <laughs> he say well i won't be there to tell you and i can tell you no you can be there even try to pretend to be dead and find out even simulate death and you'll be able to find out it is not difficult to simulate death what happens a great maharishi maharishi raman in india he discovered the truth only by pretending to be dead he was alone and he had only one servant with him and the servant went away for some errand and suddenly raman was very sick and he said my servant is not here i might die who will take care of me then suddenly a thought came to him what after all is death what will happen to me when i die there will be rigor mortis my body will become all stiff so he stiffened his body and i'll stop breathing and i'll do this so he pretended to be dead and said if i am dead who is this speaking inside me who is asking are you dead or not how is that sound stronger now that voice stronger now than it was even earlier and that led him to investigate that there is something that exists in us which never dies and therefore you can by a simple process of effective meditation actually create the experience of death while you are alive and check it out what happens it is not that you have to be constantly debating on these things without having any real information get real knowledge and the method to do it is simple if you physically die what happens you don't die all at once it sometimes it looks you have died very quickly but sometimes you die slowly if you have seen somebody dying slowly you will notice that they don't die all at once they die first in their hands and feet they become numb then they then they have no knowledge then they have them they become unaware of their extremities then they become unaware of their arms and legs they are still talking to us they are telling us put my arm on this side put my leg here they are already there they are becoming totally unaware then they become unaware of the bottom of their uh, torso feel they are floating in air then more of this uh, life force is taken out and when it goes up to the head then their brain dead they are dead that's when the death takes place so death is a withdrawal of life force from the body in stages and what is it that is creating us that the life force is all over the body if you examine carefully if you are a student of consciousness and study what is making us aware that we have a body you will find it is your attention that is going to the different parts of your body your attention is scattered all over the body giving you a feeling you have hands and feet if attention is not there you you are not aware of what you have the attention is constantly scattered in the body which makes you feel you have a body and once you have a body and eyes are open ears are open then from the body you see a material world it's a physical world because you have a physical body your attention is operating through the physical body and therefore the world around you becomes a physical world when you withdraw your attention from the physical body either by taking it to a higher place than where it is normally or lower place than it is normally you change the scene when you drop the attention to the throat level throat energy center 
you begin to dream you go to sleep you have withdrawn your attention from the body because you're not aware where the body is and a dream sequence opens up which opens a dream world you don't see a physical world when you're dreaming you see a dream world the dream world is similar to the physical world sometimes not so similar but it's not this world similarly when you take your attention above this wakeful state you open up another experience of another body and that opens up another world so these worlds which we are experiencing outside are based upon what vehicle what costume what covering we are wearing ourselves so in the physical body when we wear this we can perform that function which death performs for us by withdrawing the life force we can perform it by withdrawing our attention if we withdraw our attention from the world outside by closing our eyes sitting in a quiet place and contemplating inside not thinking about outside which means when we meditate upon ourselves what happens the longer you sit in meditation the more you forget where your hands and feet are you sit longer you forget where your legs and arms are you keep longer you forget where the body is and yet you are there you are very much there you are more there than than you are now and you will notice in that form you have different laws of nature operating a different world opens out to you this is a natural thing for our consciousness to experience so we can die while we are living and this is the secret the secret of discovering the truth the secret of discovering did we have past lives are we going to have future lives is there something in us that outlasts this physical body is not a matter of conjecture and speculation here it's a matter of actual experience and anybody can do it the method is simple withdraw your attention from the body where do you withdraw it where you feel you actually are as consciousness right now in the physical body we feel we are right behind the eyes and that is why if we put all our attention on the point behind the eyes where we feel we are operating from if we are not the body where do we operate this body from if that is the point behind the eyes if we concentrate our attention meditate upon that point meditate where we are inside and gradually we'll be able to withdraw the attention completely from the body and discover we have another body another life that was there before we were even born it's a matter of personal experience it's not a matter of making any guesswork so this is possible for all of us to do this is how you open up your door to actual reality to discovering who you are but otherwise just sitting here and reading books and debating about it and discussing it does not give us anything it's only when you practice this that you can have the actual definite 100% proof beyond any doubt just like the the experience of waking up from a dream carries 100% conviction that you are awake in the wakeful physical state is the same kind of conviction you get every time you wake up and how many times can you wake up many times it's not one time we wake up from a dream and we are awake in the physical world we awake further to a world where we find that we have all our sense perceptions intact the body is not there sense perceptions are there where are they located the how do we see with the inner body you can take an example by looking at the reflection of the inner body which is your imaginative body today you can imagine yourself moving around just an imagination supposing you imagine you have come and st stood next to me here you left your chair and come and stood next to me who is standing here then your imaginary self How, where did it come from from the same consciousness which is inside you so supposing you were able to imagine you are standing here and concentrate on th this place that you are standing next to me concentrate to the point that you are only looking at yourself here and not there this will become real for you and that where you are sitting will become imaginary it's such a game of attention we don't realize how attention is creating our experiences of reality and therefore what is real real is where we put our attention 
we have put our attention on an external world and made it all real. We have put our attention on the physical body and made it real. It's the game of attention. So when we withdraw attention, we can experience while dying, while experience death while living. There's a little story I, I used to like one day. It's a story of a parrot. I loved parrot stories when I was young. I'm going to share this particular story if you haven't heard it before. Many of you must have heard it. That there was a businessman, an importer and exporter in India, who used to go to Africa for carrying Indian silks and so on and buying uh, cashews and nuts from Africa. He used to carry one commodity from India and sold in Africa, brought other commodities from Africa, sold in India. One day while he was traveling in Africa, he was passing through a forest where there were a lot of parrots. They were beautiful parrots, so he liked one of the parrots. He bought a cage and he captured one of the parrots, put him in the cage and brought him back to India. He fed the parrot with all kinds of good food. The parrots like green chilies, you know. They, they love it. They love churi. Churi means we, we, we take a flower and make something. It's a common in India and they feed to the parrots. The parrots are very happy. They dance, they sing, you teach them how to talk. So the parrots become very friendly with you. And this particular parrot was very happy. And every day he was fed very well. Every day he sang songs and he danced in his cage. So when next time the businessman was going to Africa, he asked the parrot, do you have any message to send to your folks back home in Africa? And the parrot said, yes, tell them, I am enjoying my life in this cage. I eat shuri and I eat chilies and I dance and I sing and I am very happy. So the businessman left for Africa. When he reached there, after finishing his business, he went to the same forest and he saw all the parrots. He called them, gather here, I have the message to convey to you from the parrot I took back with me last time. So they all gathered around him and he said, the parrot I took with me has sent you this message. He is enjoying his life in the cage. He eats churi, he eats chili, he dances and sings, is very happy. On hearing this, an elderly looking parrot, older looking parrot, sitting on the branch of a tree, had tears in his eyes. And he was so sad to see him. And after that, the little parrot with the tears fell down dead. He said, this parrot must have been very close to the parrot I took home and he could not bear to hear this message and he gave up his life. Feeling sorry, he returned home and he told the parrot in the gauge. He said, I did convey your message that you are having a great time eating uh, chilies and churi and dancing and singing in your cage. But when I gave this message, there was one elderly parrot there. He had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. Upon hearing this, the parrot in the cage had tears in his eyes and he fell down dead. The man was very sorry. Why should he have conveyed this message? If one parrot couldn't take it, how, will, how would this parrot take it? So he opened the cage and threw the dead bird out. As soon as he threw the dead bird out, the bird opened wings and flew up and sat on, on a tree. And he said, oh, you are not dead? He said, no, I am not dead, nor is that parrot dead in the forest. He only sent me a message. His message was, if you want to get out of this cage, die while living. <laughs> Just a story, but gave, it makes the point that we can have that experience of what is beyond by dying while living. This teaching of the great master, Rul Maharaj Baba Sawan Singh, whose Bandara we are celebrating, the great day. Tomorrow, 2nd of April, is the anniversary of that date when he expressed himself in a radiant form that we had not really seen like that. Who has been with his disciples every day, every moment, 24-7, ever since. How can you not celebrate that occasion? How can you not see what is going on? Bandar means, Bandar is abundance. The word bandhar has been used as abundance. And 
So very often it can be abundance of food. Sometimes they celebrate bandharas and have a lot of food to eat. Bandhar also means anything else in abundance. We celebrate the 2nd of April every year. And I invite you to come and join me. I celebrate it every year. And you friends come and join me. Because it is the abundance of grace. Abundance of grace of the great master. I have not seen so much grace. So generously distributed. So freely given. So non-judgmentally distributed. Which I see on the 2nd of April. So that is why for me it is the greatest day of the year. The 2nd of April the greatest day of the year. To celebrate abundance. Bandara means celebration of abundance. So tomorrow we are going to celebrate abundance. Abundance of grace. Now how, how is grace so important? It's important because we were just talking of the futility of struggle and effort. Then what substitutes it? I said love and devotion. How do you get love? How do you get devotion? Except for grace, we don't get those things at all. It's grace that gives us love. It's grace that gives us the devotion. It is the grace. Sometimes we don't know what grace is. When we go through a spiritual training and we go through a spiritual path, gradually, step by step, we realize that the effort we were making, which we were required to make, in order to reach the point of finding out it's not effort that's going to do it, when we reach that point, we discover that grace was even in the effort we were making. That we could not have made an effort if there was no grace. That the grace starts from day one, which makes us seeker. Grace starts from day one when we start meditating. Grace starts one day one when we feel we have to get something. These feelings don't come without grace. At the end, when we reach the end of the journey and find our true home, we found the whole thing was based upon grace. That grace is the reality. That without the grace of God, without the grace of the Master, because I say grace of God and then I follow up by saying grace of Master, because Master is carrying with him at that time the consciousness of God. A Master, a perfect living Master, is not one who has had some great experiences. He is not one who has once reached his true home and come back to tell us what is it. A perfect living master is a human being like ourselves who while he is a human being sitting amongst us is still carrying the awareness of totality of consciousness of God himself at that very moment. Therefore, he carries that awareness at all times. And to be able to be in the company of such a person who is carrying that awareness, there is nothing like it. I couldn't find anything like it. That here a human being is sitting like ourselves and his awareness, in his awareness, he knows all levels of consciousness, including our own totality, where he can feel and see that we are all one and the many at the same time. We can't do that. Therefore, it's the grace of God and the grace of Master, I think they are identical. There's no difference. And that is why when we come across a perfect living Master, which means we are ready. Our time has come. And when he initiates us, definitely he has accepted that your time is ready and I have accepted you and we are going to go together. He becomes a companion, a friend, a co-traveler with us. He doesn't have to travel anywhere. He's already there. He's there when we meet him. But he becomes a co-traveler and joins us from where we are. Again, little story would illustrate this point. Once upon a time, that's how we start most stories. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a nice king, very benevolent king, who wanted all his subjects to be happy. So he would sometimes disguise himself incognito and go about looking at people, how they are living. This king once took a walk in the forest and saw an old man, not an old man, but a man very haggard because he was working so hard on logging woods using an axe to cut the woods. Then he would carry the wood to the marketplace, make a few bucks, come back and take care of himself. So he sat with this man and said that, you know, uh, I would like to help you. I'd like to take you to the king's palace. He said, nobody can go there. The man 
poor man said, do you know you talk of king's palace? There are guards way outside from there, outside the palace. They don't let anybody come near. How, how do you think you'll be able to go there? He said, I have a little acquaintance with one of the guards. And he does listen to me. He says, I don't believe you. I don't believe nobody has that kind of access. And you're just like, man, like me sitting in the forest. Better cut wood with me and work with me. So the king starts cutting wood and carrying on his back along with this man and selling in the market, became like him. Then he felt happy. He is a real person and he is not talking that foolish, foolish stuff about going to see the king and all that. Nobody can do that. So gradually, one day he convinces him that he became friends. And he had some trust in this man. He said, no, he doesn't tell lies. But he says he knows one of the guards. Maybe he does. Let's try. So goes and the king goes and beckons the guard not to mention who he is because he done that experiment to go incognito. So he tells the guard, we just want to have a little peep into the palace. Will you let us have it? And this poor man is saying, we'll probably be pushed away and we'll probably be punished for saying, doing this. The guard says, yes, since you are my friend, I let you look into the palace. So he's a little peep in the palace. Poor man, so happy I was able to see the palace. He said, you are a great guy. That you know this guard. After a few days, he says, I also know a guy who lives inside the guard. One of the, one of the attendants to the king. He said, okay, let's, so little faith has built up now. So gradually he takes him inside. And he then talks to the attendant. And the attendant says, I can, if you like, wait, I can int uh, introduce you to the minister. He said, he knows the minister also. He said, well, the attendant is introducing us. Actually, I have met the minister before. The king says, so let's go and see him. So he goes and sees the minister. Ultimately, they come back and still cut wood and sell it. And they say, you are a great guy with all these connections. Why are you cutting wood with me? He says, because I'm your friend. I am doing this thing. I am like you. I am not different. We are both woodcutters. We do both we cut our wood. We both go and sell the wood in the marketplace. I just happen to have a little connection there. Then he takes him back, takes him to the minister, and he says, Minister, can you also take us to go to the king himself who sits in the palace? Ultimately, the minister agrees. And so this woodcutter goes with the king and goes inside the palace. The throne is empty. And he says, where is the king? And the king sits on the throne. He says, I am the king. Welcome. He says, why didn't you tell me first? <laughs> he says, I, didn't, I couldn't tell you even the least part of it first. You didn't even believe that I knew a god. I, you only knew I was a woodcutter like yourself. That's why you believed me, became my friend and came to see the king. That is our state. We can't know who a perfect living master is. Unless he becomes just like us, lives like us, becomes our friend and gradually opens the door and says, here, little peek, I can show you something inside. And then ultimately takes you a little more further inside. And then, he, then you rise and fly together. You said, you know a lot about this place. He said, Let's go further. And then he knows all the different regions, all different places. And gradually the master takes us inside. And when we reach a true home, he says, I will introduce you to Satpurish, the creator of everything. And we go there and the master sits there. He was a Satpurish all the time. Not at that time. Right from day one. We are not accepting these things. We won't even accept if he doesn't become just like us. If he becomes extraordinary, we can worship him. We can't accept him as a friend, not a court traveler. That is why it is such a wonderful thing that these perfect living masters, they come and work amongst us, become like us, share our life and see no difference. That is why we become friends. That is why we experience true love of a human being for another human being. You cannot experience true love except for a human being. I am saying this so strongly because all else is attachment with the mind. True love comes from our soul. When we say, I love my house, it's an attachment to your house. I love my kids, it's an attachment to your kids. I love so and so. These statements are all made by us with a great ego. 
I do this, I am loving this, uh, as if I am a big guy, I am great because I can love so, so and so. It's only an expression of your ego. It's, it's, there's no love in it. Where there is love, there is no ego. Supposing you really fall in love with a person, a human being, have you ever noticed what happens to you? You don't talk of I at all. You talk of your beloved. The beloved occupies your mind. You think of the beloved all the time. You can't be thinking of yourself. In all other attachments, we are first thinking of ourselves and what we are doing. Even when we tell people all the time, I love you, I love you. And I hear this phrase every day. People talking to each other as if they are so insecure, they have to repeat it again and again. If you love somebody, does it disappear every second that you have to repeat, go on repeating this? When you say, I love you, supposing the other person says, I hate you, then you say, I also hate you. What kind of love is that? This is not love. These are ego trips that we make and these are attachments, infatuations, attractions based upon something else for people. My mind being attracted, sensory system being attracted. That, is, that does not constitute love. Love is something that takes hold of your soul inside. Love is something that pulls you without your knowing how it is happening. Love is that which pulls you when your whole mind is trying to fight it and still pulls you. Such a love is not easily found. It is there in this world. But you can certainly find such a love, that unconditional love, non-judgmental love in a perfect living master. I have almost come to the conclusion that there is, if you want to have a sign, who is a perfect living master? People used to give a lot of signs. Yeah, he's like an ordinary person. He does not... Uh, uh, take money from people, he gives them things, he's not a taker, he does not perform public miracles, he, he, he teaches how to go with a number of items people used to read out, most of which can be duplicated by any clever man. Any clever person can have all those and pretend to be a master. But the one thing which a person cannot pretend, and that I think is a true criterion of a perfect living master, his unconditional love, which remains unconditional no matter what happens, no matter what the circumstances. His non-judgmental compassion and love for us cannot be matched by anybody. It is that love that pulls us. And therefore, somebody says, I want to know who is your master. I say, whoever pulls you with that unconditional love, follow. Even if he's not a perfect living master, I say, still follow. Because he's taking you in the right direction, he's showing you that the journey to our true home is within ourselves and love and devotion is the real secret. So long as we know that, we are on the right track. We have come to a point here where we are so beset with our mind's activities that we want to find everything through the mind. We want to find our true home through the mind. We want to somehow think hard to find the mind. We want even to find God through meditation with the mind. Don't forget, meditation is also a mental thing. Imagine our true home, our Satchkhand, to which we belong, where totality of consciousness exists, there is no time and space. Everybody says that. Even the books say that. You are beyond time. Beyond space, time and space have been created for our experience here. Now, here is our true home out of time and space. How can you describe it? How can you talk about it? We have no language that can describe such a thing. It doesn't exist. And therefore, to think that intellectually we can do something, by physical means we can do something, is out of the question. By repeating words, which says his repetition of mantra, has anybody ever gone to a true home? Words are only local words here. How can they take you beyond the mind? How can any mantra in the world ever take you beyond the mind when it's a spoken word, spoken with your mind? How can any meditation which requires some physical asanas to be performed, body movements to be performed, body stillness to be performed, take you beyond the mind? These are all mental plans and mental activities. But the one thing that takes you beyond the mind 
is does not belong to the mind, does not belong to the body. And that is the soul's power of love, the soul's power of intuitive knowledge, intuition, the soul's power of appreciating joy and beauty and bliss. That alone, that power takes you beyond the mind. All the rest is just a preparation, just a way to find out this will not work. We work hard to find out this will not work. But can't we know it from the beginning that if it does not work, why should we try to work? The mind does not accept that. The mind does not accept that I cannot get anything that I want with my own effort. People will debate with themselves till the end. I know what I want, I can get it with my own mind. I, with my own effort. It's not somebody else's who can help me. Nobody else can help me. It's only self-help with my mind, with my own effort. I'll get it. It doesn't work. But how will you be convinced that this doesn't work? By trying hard and then failing. There was a very devoted disciple of great master. He was a judge and a finance minister in a state and highly educated person who when he retired from his job, came to great master and said, Master, I want to now serve you for the rest of my life. The great master said, you are a very highly educated person. You have held a very high position in the government. You can take any job you like. You can be the secretary general of this organization. You can be legal advisor to us. You can be this thing, all top posts that we are available in the service of this organization, which we are having this satsangs, these discourses and the initiations, you take anything you like. He said, I only want to be your doorman. Just stand outside your door. That's the only save I want. Great Master said, all right. Now that man, he's passed away, his name was Dariyai Lal. He's written some very nice books also. So Divan Dariyai Lal stood outside the door of the Great Master till the end of his life. Devandri Ailar one day told the master after a few years of that seva, he said, I have been enjoying this seva. I see people coming with such love in their eyes. It's an inspiration to see them. I am very moved when I see them. You've given me the best seva to see how much love and devotion actually exist in this world for a perfect living master. And I enjoy it. But master, I left out one thing. I did not meditate properly. I did not carry out that part of the instruction. I should be meditating. So will you give me the opportunity to meditate this summer? I understand that you are not going to your hill station resort, which you normally go in the summer, in the lousy. And will you give me the keys of your house? So I will go in your house with all the great vibration of your stay there. And I'll go and meditate there for three months without break and catch up with all the lost meditation I could not do for these few years. Great Master said, here are the keys. Go, enjoy, meditate. The man went up and he opened the door full of great anticipation, passion, anxiety. Oh, now I've got a chance. Let me see. Great Master's house. I'll be inside that. As soon as he opened, a plumber came. He said, I was waiting for somebody to come because I have a lot of work to be done inside. So plumbing work started, all knocking went on. Two, three other people came. Oh, we have, you have come, Devan Sahib. We really wanted to meet you. He tried his very best to meditate in the great master's house. He could not meditate even like what he could meditate anywhere else. And he felt so disappointed. And he went back to great master. He returned the keys. He said, sorry, master, I failed. I failed. I thought I'll be able to catch up with my meditation. I totally failed. Chris Master laughed and said, No, Divan Sahib, you passed. You passed. The whole thing was an experience for you to discover that your effort will give you nothing. You would never have found this out except by trying. And now coming to the conclusion that this is not a path of effort. Effort can give you a lot of things in the different worlds around here. Mostly in the physical world. But it is not effort that will take you back to your true home. And therefore, this is a path of love and devotion within yourself. And it is not something 
that you can have just by your mental effort or by saying with your mental will, I am going to get it, I will get it. It is not that kind of a yoga. There are many yogas based upon that principle. The hot yoga, hot means stubbornness. Hot yoga means I am going to get it no matter what. I'll sit in meditation, even if I die, I must get it. Nobody gets it. You can try it too. Anybody can try. Hot yoga has never taken anybody to their true home. How can you go above the mind except something that is beyond the mind? Something that does not belong to time and space and does not belong to things here. We are caught up here in our laws of cause and effect, in the law of karma. We are bothered all the time with our karma. We are bothered. Is it good? Is it bad? Am I going to suffer? Am I going to be rewarded? We are bothered with this law 24-7 here. And we are going to a true home where this law doesn't even exist. The entire karma that we talk about, which is holding us here and continuously drawing our attention here, is all on the mind. There is no karma on the soul, never was. The soul has never had any karma, never will. It's pure consciousness. It does not have anything to do with a created time, space and created events say, over here. These have been created by the mind so that they can be experienced through the mind. And they leave completely when we go beyond the mind. Yet we are so much trapped in these things here. So how can we rescued from here? How can any system of meditation take us beyond the mind when the whole system is based upon mental activity? It does not mean that you have to do a particular kind of yoga. And all these yogas, they are dealing with either repetition of words or they are dealing with different positions of the body or different types of breathing or physical stuff or mental stuff. The whole system is based upon things of the mind. And we are talking of going to our true home. Of course, you can get a lot of things even with these systems of yoga. If you want, if your desire is only for those, you want to be healthy, do some good breathing exercises. Call them yoga or don't call them yoga and you'll be healthier. You want to be healthy. You don't have to follow vegetarian diet or rice diet or this gluten-free diet or this diet. Just eat less. You'll be healthy. Eat one third of what you really eat, you'll be healthy. I was very pleased to find out, the latest research has told us that although the cellular intercommunication in the body is instant and cells through the nervous system communicate instantly, but the stomach to tell the brain that I am full takes 20 minutes. <laughs> it's, it's a good discovery for us to know that when we are eating food and we think we can eat more, we are actually full. Because the stomach is saying, I am full, I am full. The message is not gone yet. For 20 minutes, we overeat. And that is why we are all obese. We are overeating. We are not healthy. A simple method. Eat less. Eat much less than we are eating. We will be healthier. You can check it out. Try, try it out. So, But these are not the methods to go to our true home. These are good for other reasons. Supposing somebody wants to see the astral plane and say, there is my soul flying around. Of course, soul never flies. Soul is power of consciousness. Flight requires time and space. So soul can't fly. Soul experiences. But soul does not fly. We need something to fly with. You can fly with a, with a physical body. by taking. Somebody asked me, can you fly? I said, yes. I said, hi. I said, go and buy a United Airlines ticket. <laughs> it's not difficult to fly. These days, it's easy. In the inner self, take on an astral body, you can fly. Beyond that, go into your mind, go into a universal mind, go into that, and you can be anywhere, that's also flying. But you can't fly when we're talking of such kind of true home. This is not flight as we know it. None of the terminology we are using for spiritual experiences applies to our true home. There's no word for it at all. So that is why the words which we can use, which are actually states of being, and they are not flying or doing th something or 
something happening to us. No, it's not even happening. Not even experience. You can't even call your being in your true home an experience. Experience takes time. Therefore, there's no word for it. But it is our true home. Everything is being created from there. And imagine the possibility that we can have that state of being, of being in our true home, right where we are in our physical bodies here. There is no other form of life in which we have this opportunity. And that's amazing because there are so many forms of life. According to our Indian scriptures, they say there are 8.4 million, Chaurasi lakh, 84 lakhs, 8.4 million species of life that exist in this universe. In the current universe. Of course, in the current universe, when they talk of physical universe, they include the astrophysical overlap with it. What is the astrophysical overlap? Which means when we die and our disembodied self, which means the astral form, is still here and can stay in this form or rise above this to a pure astral form. So the form that is still here, when they can, dead bodies are removed, the, the person that stays on, is the astral form that can still move around here. Why do we call it the astral form? Because astral refers to something up in the sky. And since that body flies freely, has no gravity, so it's been given this term, astral body, and that whole area, as a whole experience is astral experience. So the astral experience overlaps this experience, and you can have the experience of this world as a disembodied spirit, if you meditate, you meditate and leave this body behind and jump out of the other body and move around. You have the experience of this world and if you fly away to a higher level, you can have the experience of a world outside of this world. They all both are part of the astral world. So since we have these experiences of the sub, or this kind of uh, overlap, overlap of the physical and astral, that is why we come across Ghosts, we come across spirits moving around. People say our house is haunted. And they say that spirits come to us at night and somebody died and the same spirit is there. Of course they are there. But they, they can see us because they have all the sense perceptions open. Even more than we have here in the physical body. We can't see them because we have our eyes covered up by these physical eyes and they restrict our vision to what is material. Eyes are the same. When we are looking with the eyes outside, we are not looking with the physical eyes. We are looking with astral eyes, through physical body, through physical eyes. Therefore, we are restricting what we can see. We are only, it's like covering your eyes with some lenses and you can only see what is in the lens. You cover your eyes with green light, green covers and the green is visible. We are looking at this and only physical is visible. We can't see more than that. But if you remove this, the same eyes which are seeing now open up and can see a lot more. Now these people who have left the body but are still here. And why are they here? Because of attachments. They are attached to people. They are attached to things. They are attached to what left behind. They can't handle it now. Some people saved money. A friend of, a friend of mine he, he saved his money, which he had inherited from somebody, and he packed it up and was hiding it all the time in his house. When he died, he was constantly there. And his wife felt it, and she asked me, what happens to a man when he dies? Does he go to heaven, or he still roams around here? I said, depends on his attachments. No, no. I said, why? Are you having a problem? No, 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 I just asked a general question. After a few days, she again says, what happens to a man, especially if he is initiated, does he not go back to such current where he dies? I said, depends upon his attachments. Oh, I said, is anybody bothering you? No. Ultimately, she once told me, yeah, somebody is bothering me. It looks like that guy is not dead. He still roams around, bothers me. I said, you loved him, why are you bothered now? I said, I can tell you, 
let me come to your house and see why is coming and bothering you maybe he loved you so much and you don't love him any more now because he's a ghost when he was a human being you loved him so that was very conditional love you said i love you so long as you're human when you become a ghost no more <laughs> anyway when we went there i said where do you feel he's going he said i feel he's always coming from this door and i feel sense him and he goes right to that corner i said what have you hidden there <laughs> no 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 nothing nothing <laughs> ultimately found out all those securities and cash which he had saved was packed up and hidden there and if she moved it to some other place he went there so there was another friend of ours who was staying with this lady and uh, the friend told me this lady will never get over this haunted thing unless she gets rid of that package that she is holding so i also advised her i said distribute the package make use of it spend it do something don't hold it the drawing the attention but she would listen so the friend then one day went and looked up the package threw it open all over and threw the currency and the securities and those big notes that were there she threw them all over this woman tried cried but then they distributed them the guy never came back what kind of love was that i am only telling you a true story that sometimes what we say haunted because the disembodied spirits are still here they are like us they would have a body and people ask me again and again how do we handle this i i felt that i was not not fair to my mother i think i treated her very badly and now she died and i feel very regret i have so feeling so guilty what can i do i give them a simple prescription it's called one word prescription it's called forgive there is nothing like forgiveness to get over this situation forgive her forgive yourself when you practice forgiveness you go over this hump which is holding you back there are so many things that hold us back our attachments our desires and our guilt is one of them i did something wrong forgive yourself so and so did so much to me how can i forgive forgive so sometimes one day my wife opened a book containing a day uh, a, what do they say a daily quote some wise statement uh, of the day and that day the wise statement was some things in our life are unforgivable that is where you should forgive when you feel something is so unforgivable that you can never forgive it's too bad too hurtful you are hurt so badly you can't forgive that's exactly where you should forgive forgiveness releases you from the problem which will stop you from going within because you can't concentrate your attention you can't pull your attention unless you are forgiven and unless you are forgiven yourself and forgiven others when you forgive you are ready to move forward i'm bringing this point because this does count on our spiritual journey on our spiritual path so if we can practice these things of forgiveness love and devotion meditation with love and devotion people say how can we have love and devotion how do you have love and devotion here you run at night you you park your car one place to meet your beloved somewhere else jump over the walls just because you have a physical love for somebody and here we talking of responding to an unconditional love if you want to practice love and devotion in your meditation in your search for the truth and search for your self sit behind the eyes your master who initiates you sitting there already he may be hiding behind a curtain the dark curtain you see is hiding behind that sitting behind not bad if my beloved sat behind a curtain i would like to talk to him and say when will you remove the curtain maybe i will go and tear apart the curtain sometimes but i will not sit idly repeating words i'll be interacting i'll be interacting with my master a master who is giving his unconditional love to us sits inside us and we sit there and we think meditation is not to think of where he is sitting what he is doing but to keep on repeating with our own mind certain words that's not meditation 
Words are used to prevent the mind of thinking of other things. Mantra is used for that. Simran is used for that. So you don't think of other things. Engage the mind in these words so that the mind can't think of other things. But it does not stop you from thinking about the master sitting inside. Talk to him. Talk to his passion. Complain to him. Be angry with him. That's all love. When you realize somebody so close to you inside and you interact like that, then you are expressing your love and devotion right from day one in your meditation. Meditation will be successful. Otherwise, you can keep on churning water, like they say in India, churning water, to hoping one day butter will come out of it. It doesn't happen like that. But, they, but it's not a mechanical thing. It's something of your passion, of your love, of your, of your feeling, being pulled and having a friend, true friend. How would you deal with a true friend? The only friend you can completely trust 100%, with whom you can share everything. <clears throat> That's the kind of friend sitting inside. If you are initiated by a perfect living master, you have such a friend sitting inside you from the moment of initiation. That is the guarantee of initiation. That's the wonder of initiation. Initiation is not a method of teaching you to do anything. Let us not think that <clears throat> initiation is a method of teaching how to meditate. You can learn from books, you can learn from anybody. And it's the simplest of methods. I am openly saying, put your attention here, that's the method. What other method do you want to learn? The mystic Bullesha says, it's not difficult to find God. Just put your attention from here over here, you'll find God. Simplifies it. Go within. Everybody says, go within. The kingdom of God is within you. Go within. Where's the problem? Method is not difficult. It's a question of how do you sustain your stay inside when the mind is constantly wandering outside? And the best method is if you have a true friend, a permanent friend inside you, in your consciousness, in your head, in the physical body, talk to him daily. Talk to him at all times. If you do that, the friend will be with you externally and internally at all times. You will have an experience of a friendship that you never had before. Because you never had a friend who is 24-7 with you. And this is a friendship that is 24-7 with you. So I, am, I have come here to celebrate the Bandara, the day of abundance of grace of the great master tomorrow. And I'm so happy that you all came to join me. Somebody said, if you were alone, would you still have a Bandara? I said, I'm never alone. I still have a Bandara. Who? I and my master. We enjoy it. We enjoy this day. And there is so much grace that flows. It's amazing to see that grace. And I'm, I welcome you all to experience this grace tomorrow, which is one of the greatest days of the year for me. Far more important than my date of birth, far more important than my wedding anniversary, far more important than the celebration of any festival. It's the greatest day of my life tomorrow. The day when Great Master became permanently visible, permanently, permanently with me at all times in all experiences. And that is what you can get by getting initiation from a perfect living master and getting his radiant form inside you, his inner form inside you at all times. That's the promise that the perfect living masters give us. They never die. And we, we should know, we also don't never die. Only bodies die. We survive. They stay with us. And they don't tell us the way to go. They take us there. They don't leave us halfway and say, now the rest you take it yourself. They take us right to the end because they are the end. And this we discover only at the end. This is the beauty of these ordinary human beings with ordinary faces, ordinary lives, and they live just like us. They will live, supposing there are disciples. I saw a great master, I saw in his life. There's a person who's very rich. There was a Maharaja. A great master walked in like a Maharaja. We all saw. And he talked to him like a Maharaja. And he talked like he had the same authority like the Maharaja in his kingdom had. When he was with a rich person, he was rich. 
when he was a very poor person in a village small village great master dressed and sat like him like a poor person why do these masters take the same level which we are at because that's the only way we can be truly friends with them that they come to our level first of all they have come to into human form because we are human beings they have taken our level within the human station there we are they take that form like us and they become our friends one of the great disciples of great master dr ishar singh that veterinary guy whose stories i tell he told me a master is friend first then master if he is not your friend first he cannot be your master master is not a teacher master is not somebody sitting on a pedestal telling you what to do a master is one who loves you like as if he and you are on the same level and from there he takes you up to the final stages i welcome you all to the celebration of this bandara and we'll have a break today i'll see you again later in the afternoon but i would like to urge make best use of this moment this day tomorrow coming up 2nd of april is a day of abundance day of bandar day of abundance of grace absorb as much as you can you will find something that you absorb can be absorbed which you may not have experienced before i i experience it every year on that day and i want to share that great abundance with all of you that i experience every year thank you very much for your very patient listening to me we'll have a break now